We are also excited, extra excited for today's speaker, Tiffany Milner, um, AIA and NOMA, recipient of AIA Philadelphia's 2021 Thomas U. Walter Award. Uh, Tiffany's been a registered architect since 2009, and she is also a wife, a mother, an artist, an author, director, graphic designer, and manager of a five-piece multi-genre band. Um, so really, this woman does everything. Um, after serving as a project manager and architectural designer at JKRP and Veta, Veta um, Milner founded a design consultancy, Ox Collective, in 2010. She currently devotes her energy as a consultant with a focus on nonprofits and artist development. Tiffany has participated in the ACE Mentor Program since 2007 as a volunteer team leader, and then also serving on several support committees at the local and national level. She grew the ACE Mentor Program of Greater Philadelphia into one of the most successful in the country by providing opportunities for young people interested in a career in architecture, construction, and engineering. She's also participating as a mentor in the AIA's Architecture and Education Program, of which we are huge fans here in Philadelphia. Tiffany actively participates in discourse about diversity and inclusion, moderates AIA diversity discussions, and serves on the AIA's National Diversity Council from 2014 to 2016, and publishes articles on the topics of women and minorities in the design industry. She is a very busy lady. Uh, as the 233rd Black female architect, um, she published a book, 200 something, to share her journey of navigating the architectural profession is gonna share uh, more of that journey with us today. So uh, please join me in warmly welcoming the speaker that we are so excited to hear from, Tiffany Brown. Thank you. Can I share my screen? Hopefully. Uh, I can't share my screen, guys. Okay. Here we go. Here we go. We got it. Okay. We got it. We got it. Girl. All right. Can y'all see that? All right. So, uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Effie. Um, thank you, Women in Architecture. Thank you, Philadelphia, AIA Philadelphia. Thank you guys for embracing me. Um, my career journey is unorthodox, to say the least, um, and it is actually beyond humbling to know that folks are actually watching. So the road to and through the Thomas U, how did I get here? So this is a journey about reinvention and the discovery of personal power um, through a series of career challenges. Um, I just wanted to have a real conversation about what it really takes to be recognized and to be honored because this is the path less traveled. Um, I'm so thankful for the Women in Architecture group that the, you guys thought of me for this event because my goodness, this is right on time. And it's really time to have a real conversation about working in, for, and with the industry. Um, all right, so what does it mean to me? Uh, it means that now I have this amazing platform and opportunity to share my journey with everyone. I've spent almost 20 years building things for and with other people. And you really never know even or, you know, or even if you would ever get the chance to kind of tell your story. So this is pretty cool. Um, but no good deed goes unpunished. So now I have the opportunity to share a cup of coffee with you guys and have a candid conversation. Um, the AIA Philadelphia recognized the impact that the ACE Mentor Program of Greater Philadelphia was making in the community. And I just happened to be at the helm of the ship at the time. The program has grown substantially over the years and this was an absolutely a team effort. Um, the program has an amazing set of volunteers school champions, board members, and I am just so fortunate to work with each and every one of them. So as some of you may know, last year I passed the leadership baton to my colleague, Melissa Raffle, um, to lead us to the promised land. Um, so, but just know that I am actually still involved and will continue to be a change agent for our Greater Philadelphia affiliate always. So with that being said, Along this road, I've learned a few key things that I just wanted to share quickly with you guys this morning. So number one, never burn a bridge. Intentionally, do what you can to work it out. If you can't, at least you could say you tried. You just never know how you may be able to support each other in the future. Seriously, keep that one in your back pocket. 
Uh, believe it or not, it's actually possible to get fired on your day off twice by the same employer. So we'll come back to that a little later. And number three, diversity is actually not the problem. Um, inclusion is. So I just want you guys to stick with me for this. We're going to break it down, right? All right. So as a registered architect, I left firm life in 2013 and then systematically started to synergize all of my passions, all the things that truly interested me, something that I could actually make some money with. <laughs> Um, but while I was working in a firm, I would actually intern as a photographer at a photography studio at night and I learned about running a small business. Um, I was pretty much forced to learn the entire, entire Adobe Creative Suite um, in addition to photography, videography and web design. So, it, you know, I, I just started to get hired as a consultant by former colleagues after I left. Um, previous employers um, called to, you know, do various things, whether it was architectural consulting, photography, shooting headshots, graphic design, community synergy. Um, I got hired to develop like a videography program to, you know, aid in a community um, revitalization project. It was amazing. Um, so in the fall of 2014, I actually started working for Ace Greater Philadelphia. Um, and the program at the time needed a little bit of a rebranding or a reintroduction to the industry. So we began picking it apart bit by bit and rebuilding on it. And rebuilding it is focusing efforts on student recruitment, which obviously you know, led to more mentor retention and mentor support, and then ultimately reaching out to our alumni and having them come back, hopefully as mentors and board members. Um, so we started to think outside of the box and really challenged ourselves to be better advocates really for the community. So we engaged ourselves in more community synergy projects and we learned how to be good stewards, both on the staff level and with the students and mentors. We competed in national competitions. We challenged ourselves to grow. Our students competed with others from all over the nation, some with far more resources and support systems, but yet we still achieved to get national acknowledgement. Over the years, we started to see student recruitment um, ultimately and retention in the urban areas. We started to see it decrease. And this is, you know, steady a little bit, you know, over the over the years. And so you know, we're an after school program and some of the students that we serve have very extremely complex lives with responsibilities at home or even taking on jobs um, to support their families. So in, I guess it was maybe a, a year or so ago, ACE 360 was born. Um, this was our effort was to, this was our effort to build a strategic partnership with the school district of Philadelphia in order to work with the students at school during school hours in their comfort zone. So we can kind of have it as an equal playing field where now the students are gonna be expected to not only come to see us after school, but hey, now we're gonna bring the mentors to you on your, on your turf, essentially. So as a culture, we've been asking, as an ACE culture, we've been asking students to make arrangements to travel to us at various professional offices in the cities for years, but we never really considered how much of a culture shock this really could be for students. Keep in mind, some of the students that we're working with, they may have never even left like a six block radius of their neighborhoods. And we were expecting them as professionals, as mentors, as you know, obviously <laughs> guardians of the industry. We we're expecting them to just adjust at like the drop of a dime to a corporate or a business culture instantly, you know, and this could really be a bit overwhelming, you know, for a student. So just by just taking a step back and shifting our mindset and just being open to share the space, essentially. Half the time we'll be working in an office or a job site and the other half the time will be spent learning soft skills and receiving additional professional development, you know, allowing our students to gain confidence, you know, with their, you know, abilities and trust, you know, ultimately with our mentors so that when they do make it to the office and they do travel and take that journey in the center city, it just won't be as overbearing. Um, so this is an instance where an organization that champions the underrepresented actually took a look at our own culture and how we operate. And then we made adjustments to try and, you know, provide a more inclusive ACE experience. 
So ACE identifies the students, we engage them in the process, and then we provide them with opportunities, scholarships, and a national network to start off on right out of high school. I, I wish I had something like this. Um, it's an amazing foundation. So ACE provides the diversity, but we're seeing where academia and industry are slow at developing a culture to actually nurture and retain this diversity. There are many instances where we're seeing our ACE alumni hit a wall in only their first year due to just pure culture shock. It really is. Um, exclusive and extremely competitive environments, lack of support, and we're identifying students and making more of a concerted effort and having them prepared for the next steps, but there's still obviously a breaking point. So what's really happening in academia and in industry? So as we all know, unsupportive and exclusive academic and work environments happen. Seriously, nothing is changing anytime soon. Um, our industry is one of the oldest yet slowest to diversify and actually be able to retain the diversity. Oops, excuse me. So let's start with academia. I just have to give a shout out to Taya, I don't know if you're on, just for recommending this statistical reference and lecture to us yesterday during our Jade meeting. Um, it was enlightening to say the least. So Whitney M. Young Jr. Award winner, Pascal Sablon recently gave a lecture highlighting the statistics from NCAR regarding enrollment and graduation from architecture school. So apparently only 5% of student applications for architecture are coming from black students. And then only 3% actually graduate. So already we're losing about 2% of our applicants either through the rigors of the curriculum, financial burdens, or lack of support and inclusion. So what happens to the 3% when they actually enter the industry? No, so let's take a quick cross section of what diversity actually looks like while navigating a career path in the design and construction industry. So. Uh, well, by definition, I just happen to be the diversity. So using myself <laughs> as a case study, I see we can all agree that I am a minority. I'm female, I am African-American, I am in that age bracket, uh, registered architect, 233, and I do not like chocolate. So again, I must be the minority. <laughs> um, so just using myself as a case study, <laughs> I can actually pinpoint three key moments in my own short 20 year career that due to lack of inclusion, my personal career path has shifted. It led me to where I am now. Um, and believe it or not, as we go through these, I am honestly thankful for each one of these situations because they're a reminder that no matter what mountain you overcome, there's gonna be another one. And it really is all about personal growth and resiliency. So a little crowd participation. I know you could put a little high five up on the screen. Um, raise your hand if any of these things have ever happened to you. Passed over for a promotion. Anybody, anybody, let's do it. Yeah, man. Yep. Good morning, guys. So how did I react? <laughs> I, I actually said nothing um, and let the situation eat at me for a couple of years. Uh, I was working in a firm. I literally developed, you know, and cultivated a client for years. Um, but at that point, it seemed like the client wanted to work with somebody that looked like the total opposite of me. So they went with a white man. Um, but, you know, this is one of those situations where it's like, gosh, I said something. No, I didn't. I just walked around, you know, feeling undervalued, you know, underappreciated. And, you know, you become the moody black girl in the office. And I actually ended up leaving that firm. Um, but I just, we, we're still in contact um, at, to this day. Um, and we support each other on various levels. So, you know, at the time, I got to say, I understood their position as a business, um, but, you know, it didn't mean it hurt any less. Um, so that's just one thing I had to live with. All right. So after two years of trying to make it work after that happened, you know, staying in that comfort zone, I quit this job on a Thursday and I cashed out my 401k. Um, and I actually started consulting full time um, and continued to build my network, which was ultimately the catalyst to where I am now. All right, number two. 
try to see a scripture dictionary. Um, not hired for a position or received any type of discrimination because you were with child. All right, so how did I react to this one? <laughs> well, ultimately, I had the baby. <laughs> Um, but you know, I, I gotta say, I went into this interview and I knocked it out the park. You know, I probably shouldn't even said anything. You know, I just felt compelled to tell them because the position needed me to start at the exact same time that I was actually due to give birth to my first child. So um, I interviewed, but after weeks of no response, I actually had to contact the organization myself and say, hey, was it was the position filled? And I received a mobile text like on a Saturday morning. Uh, Yes, we went with someone with more experience. Enjoy your time with your baby. Ooh, so I was like, oh, okay, okay, great. So after this incredibly time missed opportunity, this is when I went on to strengthen the Greater Philadelphia Affiliate. Um, and it really became my Petri dish, you know, for community involvement and all kinds of things that I just had to get off my chest. Um, and then I had another baby. So and that guy showed up. All right. So number three, this is a good one. So ladies, uh, I was forced to resign and then terminated from a company after asking for a raise based on work performance, All right? So anybody? No, no, that didn't happen to anybody. Okay, so how, how, my, how did I handle this? Well, it's, it, you know, let's see. Well, actually, this is actually very true. Um, still trying to figure this one out, uh, cause believe it or not, this actually happened to me the day after I accepted the Thomas U. Walter award ladies. So if anyone has any advice, I am totally here for it. Um, and yes, this is real life. After two weeks, there was no negotiation, no counter offer. And it seems to me, if you valued this person or at least the diversity that they brought to the table, that would have at least earned, you know, me the respect to have a conversation. But I was actually told that my request for additional compensation would have been better received if based on relieving family or household burdens rather than focused on my work performance. Uh, could have just said no, but that's okay. We're here now. So there have been three instances throughout my career alone where there was an element of diversity in an environment. And then for one reason or another, the company or the organization's culture revealed that they either did not value the diversity or it really wasn't truly of importance in the first place. I've seen a lot of energy put into the optics on social media about supporting diversity especially in the African-American communities. But what really needs to change cannot be seen. Culture is your brand. And until our industry really starts looking at the core of its issues for any efforts in diversity, we will be met with challenges, again, in inclusion and retention. So can we talk about this? Can we have some coffee and talk about this? Has anyone ever witnessed or experienced exclusion in your career? Um, and what did you do about it? Did you have the flexibility and the resiliency to make a course correction if need be? Did you speak up for yourself in order to provoke a change? Were you an advocate for yourself or for others? Have you ever just were forced to step outside of a comfort zone? I don't know, let's go, let's go. Let's talk about it. I went first. 